Welcome to AISC's live webinar, Direction Engineering, the Science Behind the Art, presented by Will Jacobs and Clint Rex. I am Patrick Newman. I'm with the AISC's Continuing Education Group, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. I want to introduce today's speakers. Will Jacobs received his Bachelor of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Clemson University and his master's degree in structural engineering from Virginia Tech. He is a principal at Stanley D. Lindsay & Associates in Atlanta, Georgia, where he has been involved in the design of building structures throughout the southeast. He is currently licensed as a PE or SE in five states. Mr. Jacobs serves as a member of AISC's Committee on Manuals and is vice chair of AISC's Task Committee on C Composite Construction. He is also Associate Committee Member of ASCE's 37 Design Loads on Structures During Construction, ASCE's National Technical Planning Committee, and ASCE's Committee on Composite Design. Also speaking will be Clint Rex. Clint is also a principal at San Luis Lindsay and Associates in Atlanta. He received his Ph.D. and M.S. in Civil Engineering from Virginia Polytechnic University. He received his B.S. in Civil Engineering from the University of Cincinnati. He is currently licensed in seven states. Dr. Rex is currently Chair of the Steel Subcommittee for the Structural Engineers Association of Georgia, Secretary of the ASCE Committee on Steel Building Structures, and a member of the AISC Task Committee 4 on Member Design and Task Committee 10 on Stability for the AISC specification. And with that, Will, I'll hand it over to you. All right. Thank you, Patrick. I certainly appreciate it. Uh, good afternoon or morning as the case may be. Um, again, my name is Will Jacobs with Stanley D. Lindsay & Associates in Atlanta. I'm going to be giving the first portion of the webinar, and then I'll turn the reins over to uh, Clint to give the middle portion, and he'll give things back to me to finish up. Uh, I'd like to apologize in advance for the uh, congested voice and possible coughing fits. I'm a little bit under the weather, but that will not stop us from talking about the exciting topic of erection engineering, the science behind the art. Um, I'm going to assume that many of you are most likely uh, building design engineers. So you might have limited, if any, familiarity with erection engineering. And I was solidly in that same camp up until a few years ago. And really my familiarity with erection engineering sort of started and ended with this typical note that we put on all of our structural drawings. You probably have a similar note. And it reads like this. The structure is stable only in its completed form. Temporary supports required for stability during all intermediate stages of construction shall be designed, furnished, and installed by the contractor. The contractor is responsible for construction analysis and erection procedures, including design and erection of false work, temporary bracing, etc. Right, so if you're the structural engineer of record, this is a great note. You know, it's, it's means and methods. You sort of wash your hands of the whole deal. But what does this actually mean for the contractor, and more specifically for this presentation, the steel erector? Well, what it means is that it's the steel erector's responsibility to make sure that the structure is stable in each and every phase of construction until that structure is completed per the contract documents. So for your standard typical building design, how does the steel erector meet this note? What well, really boils down to experience. Um, you know, erectors have certified riggers. They know how to plumb columns. They know how to swing steel. They know how to stuff bolts. They do this day in and day out, and they have a pretty good feel for what's going on. So they generally don't need a engineer to come in and try to tell them what to do. But if you're like me, you've noticed that building designs are getting more and more complicated. Um, architects are trending toward more complex geometries. You're seeing more long span elements, more trusses, more transfer elements. 
And when you start getting into things like this, sometimes the experience needs a little help, need a little bit of engineering to um, determine exactly how many braces are necessary or, or whether they can pick that truss up. So the kind of erection engineering we're going to be talking about today is engineering that's used to supplement the erector's experience in order to provide a safe product. So when I first started getting into this uh, sort of subset of structural engineering, I noticed right away that it was definitely its own uh, complete little world. You know, it even has its own language. You have terms such as turnbuckles and cable dogs and chokers and baskets. You know, when I, when I first went to a meeting and the erector asked me if I could design him a, a spreader bream with a, a two-legged bridle sling to some cable chokers, you know, I just sort of nodded and tried to look intelligent and said, no problem. And then I went back to my office and spent the rest of the afternoon Googling to figure out exactly what the heck he just asked me. Uh, there's also some terms up here that might help you in your everyday engineering, even if you aren't into erection engineering when you go out into the field. Um, for instance, this term, colume. Uh, those are those vertical things that tend to hold up the floors and the roofs of buildings. Uh, generally in my office we would refer to them as columns, but if you go out into the field, colume seems to be the, the preferred moniker. And columns are supported by these, these square concrete things known as footers. Uh, again, in your office, probably called footings. So you sort of have to get into the language and, and understand what the guys are talking about. So today's presentation is sort of outlining the experience we've had over the past few years and determining what are the rules to play by. You know, is there any technical guidance out there? And what loads you need to consider? And then probably paramount to erection engineering is the issue of stability. And we're going to tackle that issue by going over uh, a couple of case studies ranging from simple, or at least seemingly so, to really complex. And finally, the most important topic for really any structural engineering is communication. So we'll go over how you can convey the plan to the workers that are going to be performing this in the field. Okay, so we'll start at the top. What are the rules to play by? And sort of the master playbook of them all for structural engineers would be the International Building Code. The 2012 version has now made it up to, I believe, 1,950 pages. And in those 1,950 pages, the word erection is mentioned once, right here. In highlighted text, the design, fabrication, and erection of structural steel for buildings and structures shall be in accordance with AISC 360. So as this is an AISC webinar, uh, they come off looking good here. They've got things covered. So IBC sort of punted. So we go over to our trusty 14th edition steel manual. And erection engineering is really covered in two different sections. Uh, the first would be in the specification in section M4.2. And the second in the code of standard practice, section 7.10.3. So we're going to take a look at each of these in turn, starting with the specification. So the specification states, again in highlighted text, that the structure shall be secured to support dead, erection, and the mysterious other loads anticipated to occur during the period of erection. And that temporary bracing shall be provided in accordance with the requirements of the Code of Standard Practice. All right, so this sort of says what needs to happen. And it refers you to the Code of Standard Practice. So we'll take a look at that. The Code of Standard Practice says that it is the erector shall, that shall determine, furnish, and install all temporary support, such as temporary guys, etc. Right, so this gives you the who. So we now have really the legal basis behind that technical note, uh, general note that I provided at the beginning of the presentation. And this gives you what needs to happen, and that there does need to be some temporary supports and bracing, and who needs to do it, which is the erector. But it still doesn't really provide the how. You know, what loads need to be used, and, and how do you provide for the stability? So we kept looking, and the next set of rules really comes in with OSHA. You know, all contractors need to meet OSHA requirements, and OSHA certainly does have some rules that are applicable to erection engineering. Um, for instance, uh, four anchor rods are required for columns being erected. They give maximum height-to-width ratios of unbraced scaffolding. Uh, your shear connectors or, or studs need to be applied in the field only. Um, they give minimum loads for column splice designs and things of that nature. So a lot of rules that definitely make the job site safer, but we're still no closer to really 
coming up with the how, the loading, the stability design. So what we found is there really are no definitive rules for erection engineering. And when you're used to dealing with a 1950-page building code, it's actually sort of refreshing to uh, find an area where you're able to uh, flex your muscles a little bit, so to speak. But there is a good bit of technical guidance out there. So we sort of collected a couple of references that I, I'd like to go to. And the first, and probably the most useful of them, would be AISC's Design Guide 10. Um, this is Erection Bracing of Low-Rise Structural Steel Buildings. And this is a, a very good comprehensive document that discusses um, cable bracing, different temporary loadings, the design of dead men, a lot of items like that that you are going to encounter over and over again. So sort of a must-have item. You're also going to want to pick up a copy of ASME's BTH-1, which is the design of below-the-hook lifting devices. Now this document covers the design of things such as lifting lugs and spreader beams. And AISC has a section in the specification, I believe it's section D5, that covers pin connections. But that section is really intended for um, tight-fitting, permanent-type pin connections, while this document covers more loose-fitting, repetitive-use-type connections, so things that you'll see more often in construction and erection engineering. The third document would be the Wire Rope User's Manual. This document covers the areas, elongations, and strengths of different types of wire that you might be using as guy wires and bracing. And finally, there's a whole slew of different manufacturer's catalogs, such as Surtex or Crosby, where you can pick out turnbuckles and shackles and things like that to use within your work. Okay, so that's the rules to play by, the technical guidance, and now let's get into sort of what loads you need to consider. And one of the first things that struck me as being a little different in, in uh, erection engineering versus your standard, say, building design, is that the loads are definitely real. And what I mean by that is if you're designing, let's say, a 40-story building, and you've got 80 pounds a square foot of live load that's required by code at each and every corridor all the way up and down the building, if you've seen a picture of what 80 pounds a square foot looks like as far as people crammed into the room, you probably feel pretty good that you've got a little bit extra in your pocket with that kind of design. But if you have a situation such as this, and this is a uh, two-story tall um, bridge that we were uh, lifting and putting into place as one unit, and they say that it weighs 300,000 pounds, guess what? It really does weigh 300,000 pounds. And there's a reason that those cranes have all those counterweights on them. So when you come in and you design the spreader beam and the lifting lugs that these gentlemen are about to attach together, you need to make sure that your load path is there, that you've crossed your T's and dotted your I's because those elements are definitely going to see that load. Sort of another difference between standard engineering and erection engineering would be within the deflection limits and uh, really the lack thereof. You know, for typical building design, you pay a lot of attention to serviceability considerations, um, especially, for instance, the perimeter beams where you are um, checking for deflection limits against facade elements such as brick veneers or curtain walls. Well, in erection engineering, it doesn't matter that uh, you meet a certain limit. What matters is that you actually accommodate whatever deflections you have within the plan. Right? So what's shown on the screen right now is an instance of us accommodating some large deflections. And in this case, um, we also happen to be uh, the engineer of record for the building, but we were erecting a 144-foot-long, 500,000-pound transfer truss over the top of an existing judicial building. And this truss was just too big for us to lift it up in one pick, so we decided to build it in the air. Um, so what we did was we cantilevered out twin W36 beams that you can see here, here, and here, with rods going down to support each section of the truss as it was put into place to support that section of truss until they were tied together. So when you take a look at that from up above, this is the, those twin W36 beams sticking out. We calculated that the deflection at the tips of these beams was going to be about 9 inches. So in a standard building, you probably wouldn't design a beam to deflect 9 inches. But in this case, uh, in order to be 
economical. That's what we did, but we had to accommodate that deflection within the design. So the way we did that, and if you look closely out at the tips of the beams, is that we provided sort of a, a pin and cradle system at the end so that as the beams tipped downwards, the uh, verticality of the hydraulic jacks that were holding up the rods was maintained with those rods, sort of rotated as the beams went down. Uh, something else just to notice about this picture is the use of hydraulics. Um, hydraulics end up being used a lot in erection engineering. Generally, structural engineers are sort of adverse to things moving within their designs, um, but in erection engineering, that is sort of a, a way of life. So now we'll move on to probably the most important loading document, and that is ASCE 37, which is the design loads on structures during construction. This document is sort of the ASCE 7 of construction loading. Um, it contains lots of information on construction dead, live, wind, and seismic loads. Uh, it was released in 2002. Um, there's been five internal committee ballots on an updated version, and I believe a public ballot will occur sometime next year. So you're probably going to be looking at a revised document, um, I would say, the end of next year for this standard. Now this document has different live loads in it, um, different live load classes uh, for use within temporary structures and, and construction. One that I'd like to point out that's uh, applicable maybe to a lot of your designs is this light duty class. This class includes the placement of concrete by hose, so your standard you know, composite beam and deck kind of design. You're going to want to use 25 pounds a square foot as the live load for your pre-composite sort of construction live load. Um, that maybe differed from the 20 that um, has traditionally been used. But really, the most important thing, or the thing that affects erection engineering the most within this document, is this concept of wind loads on the temporary structures. And you might think that you know, when you have a wind load on a structure that's being built, it should be less than the wind load that you would have on the final structure. And that would be the case. For instance, uh, this document gives reduction factors for wind velocities for different construction periods. So here for a construction period of less than six weeks, we get a 25% reduction in the wind velocity that's used to calculate the wind pressures, so a, a multiplication factor of 0.75. Well, if you want to compare the actual pressure that's blowing against the temporary uh, building versus the permanent condition, you need to take this factor and square it. Right? All of ASCE 7's wind load calculations involve the velocity squared to get pressure. So we'll square those numbers, and now for the same construction period, you end up with a force reduction factor of about 50%. Okay? So that's reasonable. You get half of the load. But, and this is a big but, for most structures under construction, they're actually composed of a lattice work of steel beams. So you end up having a drag factor on each one of those beams that really isn't present in the final condition. So these drag factors can be up to two. If you take these numbers and you double them, now all of a sudden you're up to having pressures that are higher in the temporary condition than in the permanent condition. Uh, luckily, you can reduce those somewhat for uh, shielding effects. ASC 37 is, is pretty conservative with this. They only give you a reduction of about 15%. So if you factor that in, your final ratios of uh, temporary construction loading versus permanent wind load pressures is about one. They're about the same. Right? The difference comes in with what amount of area that same pressure is blowing against. So if you look at sort of a standard building design, in the permanent condition with wind load going from, let's say, right to left on the screen, it would be blowing against a facade. So it would be hitting the face of the building once. But in this condition, the wind load is going to hit each and every one of these W24 girders all the way down the building. Right? So there's actually a lot more area for the wind to blow against in the construction condition. And just to drive this point home, what we did was we took the example building provided in AISC's 14th edition design examples. And if you look at the wind base shear um, that's calculated within those design examples, you get about 170 kips. Well, if you take the same building and you run it as a uh, structure under construction with ASCE 37, you get a base shear 
of 600 kips. So the temporary wind load is over three times what the permanent structure wind load is. And that's definitely a problem for erection engineers. And there's a couple of ways you can try to handle this. Um, first off, uh, ASE's Design Guide 10 that we discussed earlier does have a uh, less conservative alternate method for shielding that can help you out a good bit. Um, you can also look into using uh, reduced velocities than ASC 37 provides. Now, when you do that, you have to make sure you discuss it with the erector and, and the owner to make sure that everybody's on board and understands that there might have to be an alternate bracing scheme um, sort of waiting in the wings to be able to be put up if something catastrophic happens. And Clint's going to be discussing that, I believe, a little bit more in his portion of the presentation. So that brings us to the end of this first portion on loading and technical guidance. I'll be happy to take a couple of questions if there are any before we turn it over to Clint for the uh, stability portion of the presentation. Well, we don't have anything right now, Will, so let's just um, continue with Clint then. All right. <clears throat> so this is Clint Rex. Uh, I'm going to be handling the next part of the uh, presentation. And what I'm going to be talking about are stability issues. The uh, heart of what we really do as erection engineers centers around keeping temporary structures, temporary steel structures in this case, stable uh, during, these, uh, during these early time periods of their life. We've taken the idea of stability and we've kind of broken it into three uh, groupings, if you will, a simple, complex, and really complex for purposes of this presentation. So to go into what we might uh, group as a simple type design, what uh, I want to focus on are um, some designs associated with some shoring towers that we had in place for the erection of a pedestrian bridge. You can see the pedestrian bridge sitting on some uh, steel beams at the top, some shoring towers, and then those shoring towers sit on some steel cribbing beams at the bottom. This is a picture then of the cribbing beams down at the bottom. Those are supported by some uh, temporary helical anchor foundations in the ground. Well, at first glance, certainly we would think that this should be a pretty straightforward design. It's uh, steel beams sitting on one another. What's so hard about that? Just PL over 4 or WL squared over 8, however you want to come up with your design. Well, to get started, we have to go into the specification. And one thing we've found since getting into uh, the erection engineering business is that you have to really read the fine print of the specification and the commentary in order to understand maybe all of the rules. Much of what is written in the specification was geared around the thought that these provisions would be used for building design and or, uh, build, or something that looked like a building. Well, what we're doing in erection engineering doesn't always look like a building design. So we do need to write, read the fine print. We go to Chapter F to design our flexural member here. And right in the scope, right up in the front, it seems to suggest something about that we're dealing with members that are restrained against twisting at their load points and supports. All right, I'm not sure entirely what that means yet, but we're going to keep going. We go further into the provisions, and we see once again they uh, are referring to the fact that this, these are really written with the idea that the beams and girders are restrained against rotation about their longitudinal axis. So how does that apply to what I'm doing? We go further and we look into the, the manual we find in part two of the 14th edition manual, uh, additional verbiage on this exact issue, as well as a picture that shows us what's going on. And what they're intending is for us to restrain the twist of this beam by putting in some stiffeners perhaps at the support points. Well, that's fine. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. We can put the stiffeners in. We can set our beam on our supporting beam. However, what we've found in uh, <clears throat> putting in these cribbing beams and in much of the erection 
uh, engineering and the steel that goes out there is sometimes it's hard to fabricate things ahead of time that really are going to lay out the way you wanted them to. So it becomes cumbersome to keep putting these stiffeners in, particularly if you end up having to field apply them. So there's got to be another way of looking at this. Fortunately, we had a friend on one of our uh, steel committee meetings that uh, handed us a two-page summary of the issue. He had put this summary together as part of a uh, talk that he did on connection design. And it summarized the whole issue in, in less than two pages, which is really a good thing anytime you can summarize a complicated issue in such a short uh, paragraph. So the first part of the issue is what does the fact that we don't have the stiffeners do to our lateral torsional buckling capacity? Well, it describes this idea that you're going to have additional distortion at the support points, and that additional distortion is going to reduce your lateral torsional capacity. That makes sense. I understand that. The picture seems to uh, convey that very well. It's not going to maintain the verticality at my support. But what do I do about it? What, how much is my lateral torsional back, uh, buckling capacity reduced, and how do I calculate that? Fortunately, it went on to describe two or three different methods that one could use to approach this. Uh, the one that I liked seemed to be the simplest, was found in the 1985 version of the British Standard. And what it does is it uses a fake length for the beam to calculate the lateral torsional buckling capacity. That length is the real length plus two times the depth. And by adding two times the depth to the member, it accounts for this additional flexibility or additional distortion that we have at the end. So that uh, gets us back on track. We're working right along. However, we still need to make sure that the, the beam's not going to roll over on us. And in fact, inherent in all of this is this idea that the beam is, in, is, is held down somehow, not able to just twist over on the end. How do we do that? What do we do to restrain the beam? So we could use some bolts, but again, that gets into the fabrication issue. How do you uh, know for sure that the bolts are going to be where you, bolt holes are going to be right where you need the uh, the bolts? It doesn't always work out that way in the field. We could use welds. Welds certainly work out great in the field. However, they make it very hard to take this temporary steel in this case apart because all of this steel was going to be removed from the site after the fact. So instead, what we've been using are, or become our favorite are these, these industrial size clamps, which have uh, some defined capacities. And they work very well for clamping these pieces of steel, give us lots of variability and holding power. But what do we need to design those clamps for? How do we know how much force needs to be potentially uh, carried through these clamps. Well, we went into the uh, specification and we looked to the bracing provisions found in Appendix 6. And in there, you're going to find torsional bracing provisions. Uh, under the torsional bracing of beams, there's a section on nodal bracing. And that's where you'll find this top equation that you see here on this slide. Now, in the case of our cribbing beam, we can simplify this somewhat. We know the length of my unbraced element is the same length as my uh, beam, so the L's drop out. We also know then the definition of N in this case is the number of nodal brace points within the span. Well, I don't actually have any brace points within the span. I have them at the ends. So in this case, we're going to use an N of 1. And then we'll take the moment to be the maximum moment along the span. So our top equation boils down to something that's a little simpler in terms of that bottom equation. To drive the idea home then, let's go through just a very simple example of how we might design these cribbing beams. We've got a 10-foot span, a load in the middle of about 45 kips. We can figure out our moment, PL over 4, no problem. The moment capacity then, the lateral torsional buckling capacity, 
for a beam length of 11.4. Now, 11.4 is our 10 feet plus two times the depth of the beam. The moment capacity for that in a CESA B01 is 104 kip feet. But our C actual CESA B for this case is 1.32. So by the time I make that adjustment, in fact, my lateral torsional buckling capacity will exceed my plastic capacity, and therefore I get to use my plastic capacity and everything is good. What about the clamp forces then? I take the equation that we just looked at, I plug in my moment, I plug in my C sub B, and I get an overturning uh, twisting moment there at the end of 2.05 kip feet. That turning moment is going to be resisted by the base of the beam. The base of this beam has a flange of 8 inches, so I take that moment, divide it by my 8 inches in order to get about a 3 kip force on my clamp. So that's what I would proceed with <coughs> designing my clamp for. So moving on to the complex, what we uh, have kind of classified into this grouping are what we call freestanding trusses, long freestanding trusses. And here we have a picture of an example of that kind of truss. We've got our handy dandy engineer hanging out below it to make sure everything is working OK. The issues <clears throat> involved are the following. First of all, these are trusses that the erector by and large, is not very concerned with how are they going to pick it up and how are they going to get it over into the position that it needs to be. Their primary concern is after I get it to where it goes and I make my temporary connections to the columns or other supports that it's supporting it, can I let it go? And if I can let it go, how long can I let it go without some sort of bracing into it? And that's where we start getting into the wind issues or the environmental loads, in this case wind, <clears throat> and whether or not we can let it sit for the day, the week, the month, and trying to figure out just how much wind we have to deal with. If we find that we do need some sort of temporary bracing, we're going to need to design some temporary bracing to stabilize the truss so that they can release the crane and get the other parts. And then finally, the splice connections. These trusses come, are, are very long trusses, and they're always going to come in pieces, two or three pieces most of the time. There's going to be splice connections that are made in the field. The design of those splice connections and the forces that were contemplated for the design of those are based on the final building construction most of the time. The temporary loads that this truss will see during the erection stage will put very different loads on these splice connections. And we need to make sure that those kind of loads can be carried by whatever splice connection is contemplated. The other issue at hand is a lot of times these splice connections may be field welds, perhaps full pen welds. In those cases, the erector might want a temporary bolted connection that they can use to put the truss up get going onto another piece while somebody else sits there and welds. So again, we're back to needing to know what kind of forces these temporary connections need to be able to deal with. How do we evaluate these issues? Well, we've used some pretty simple hand calculations, and we've used some fairly sophisticated computer analysis. And we're going to talk about both of those approaches. First, let's focus on the hand methods. Most of the time, by the time we're brought in uh, to start looking at these issues, the fabricator has a real good idea of just what this truss is going to weigh, <coughs> including the connections. So we get the weight from the, the fabricator. We take that weight, and we typically smear it over the length of the truss. We do a WL squared over 8, M over D type analysis in order to get an approximate cord force. At that point, we take the compression cord out of the truss, and we treat it as if it's just a, a standalone column that has an axial load equal to that compression force we just calculated. We're going to take that cord, and we're going to sweep it out of plane. And that sweep typically we take as a magnitude of about L over 1,000. And that simply comes from an ASTM rolling tolerance. We're going to look at the stability, i.e., how easily will this cord buckle 
using a, an approximate second order uh, method called B1, B2. In this case, we're focused on the member stability, so we'll be using B1. And then we're going to have to figure out our wind loads. We'll review unity checks in terms of the strength of the cords. And of course, we talk about splices and looking at what forces to deal with in the splices. And then finally, if we do need bracing for these, typically the bracing can be uh, determined using the provisions out of Appendix 6. The computer analysis is going to be a form of the direct analysis. You're going to model your truss just like you would in any computer analysis. Typically you're going to have nodes at each of your panel points there. You'll have a couple of extra nodes <clears throat> where we have our splices so that we can get splice forces straight away. We're going to need to scale the computer analysis up or down in terms of its weight in order to better match the real truss weight. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. We're going to sweep the cords. Uh, we're going to talk about that in more detail again in just a minute, so I don't want to go too much into that now. The top and bottom cords in your truss analysis are going to need to be continuous. And the reason for that, it's obviously contrary to the typical two-dimensional truss analysis that many of our use, we are used to, where we just assume the cords are pins at these same nodes, and we have uh, very simple forces throughout. However, when you've got nothing else holding the truss in place, as is the case when we're erecting the truss, those cords in fact have to be continuous for everything to maintain stability. And in the case of an analysis, the same is true. We have to have continuous cords in order to have a stable analysis. The web members, on the other hand, do not necessarily have to be fully welded or fully pinned I'm sorry, either pinned or fixed to the cords in order for this analysis to run. So whether we treat those as pin connections or we treat them as fixed connections somewhat depends, and we'll study that. We obviously have to determine wind loads just like any other. We're going to review the unity checks. The unique part of the unity check here is that we're going to be looking at the distance between the nodes that we modeled. And in this case, we probably have a node at each panel point, so we'll be looking at the length uh, associated with the panel. Splice forces, again, directly from the analysis. That's why we put additional nodes in there. And then if we need bracing to stabilize the truss temporarily, the best place to find that is, in fact, in the analysis at this point. What about this sweep? So for a simple truss, which is most of the time what we're dealing with in this case, <clears throat> we're going to sweep the cords. The top and bottom cord we're going to sweep in opposite directions. What we're uh, attempting to do here is really put the truss into an initial deformed shape that closely resembles what we think the buckled shape will look like. Now, at the end of the day, we're not sure if the buckled shape will be top and bottom going in the opposite directions, but what we have found in our studies is that this kind of gives us our worst answer. So this is the way we start. If we do need bracing in order to stabilize the truss temporarily, this is the model with these sweeps that we would use to put our bracing element in to the analysis and figure out just how much load and stiffness it takes to hold the truss in position, i.e., for the brace to be effective. After you've sized that brace, though, then you go about reshaping the truss into its next buckled mode. So in this case, the second uh, picture down here, this one right here, shows what might happen if we put a brace in the middle and what the second buckled mode would look like, and that's how we're going to shape our truss. <coughs> so let's study this by looking at a couple of real life case studies of, uh, of trusses. The first one are some long span roof trusses. Simple span roof trusses, 120 feet long, 11 foot center to center on the cords. The top cord in this case is a 12 by 65, the bottom cord is a 12 by 53 and the webs are all 12 by 45s. The top and bottom cords are turned strong axis sideways. 
So we're actually looking at the flanges on these cords. And then the uh, cord splices are near the mid-span. So we want to go into a hand analysis first just to get a sense of where we might be. We are going to get our truss weight from the fabricator. It comes in right around 32,000 pounds. At this point, I want to step out of the analysis just for a minute. We're going to do a computer analysis of this same truss <clears throat> and shortly. When we do that, we're going to have a bare weight for the truss of about 27,500 pounds. That bare weight relative to the, connect to the uh, weight of the truss we got from the fabricator gives us what we call a connection factor. And it's simply a measure of how much more the truss weighs uh, because of the connections of the truss. That number in this case comes into, uh, in at about 1.16. On average, we've found that to be somewhere in the range of 1.1 to 1.25. However, for a fully welded tube truss, that number actually could be something less than one. And for a very heavy bolted truss, that number could be upwards of 1.5. The point is that connections are an important part of the truss weight, and we certainly have to account for them uh, when we're looking at these issues. So jumping back into the uh, problem, we take that 32,000 pounds, we divide it by the length of our truss, <clears throat> we get an effective uniform load, we do WL squared over 8, and we take that moment, divide it by the depth of our truss, and we get a cord force. We take that cord out of the truss now, and we're going to sweep it. We're going to sweep it at all over 1,000. In this case, that's 1.44 inches. That gives me an initial moment on the cord with that axial load of about 63 kip inches. So these are my initial conditions that I'm going to be checking that cord for. I have an axial load, I have a moment, and I have a, a column geometry. <clears throat> so let's look at the stability of that cord uh, in order to consider whether or not the truss might buckle. First thing we're going to do is look at KL over RX. Again, these cords are turned sideways, so it's the strong axis of the cord that is keeping this truss from buckling. KL over RX in this case is 272. Now that might be a little high if you're considering the design of columns, where we think of 200 as being a reasonable limit. But in fact, when we're talking about cords of trusses, where the trusses eventually are going to be braced by lots of other elements, that's not necessarily that high. We're going to look at the stability of that cord by looking again at these uh, approximate second order factors, B1 and B2. These factors can be found <coughs> in Appendix 8 of the specification. B1 is the member stability effect. So that's the one we're interested in and we'll be using here. C sub M we'll take as 1 because we're going to be applying transverse loads in the form of wind. And if that's the case, we're supposed to take it as 1. It's conservative, but a reasonable assumption. And then we need to figure out the buckling capacity of this, of this cord. That's just pi squared EI over L squared. That is not new. What is a r relatively new in that equation, though, <coughs> is the EI star right here, this star. That was introduced to try to make sure that the stiffness that is used for this calculation is consistent with the stiffness that you're using in the overall analysis. So the stiffnesses we use for effective length analysis and direct analysis are in fact different. <coughs> in this case, we could certainly argue that we're doing an effective length analysis and the effective stiffness would be just taken as 1 because there's no stiffness reduction required. However, we're going to be doing a computer analysis of the same truss. So for purposes of this illustration, I have used a 20% reduction or multiplying by 0.8 here in order to make sure that I'm comparing apples and apples because my computer analysis is going to be a version of the direct analysis which requires that stiffness reduction. So that gives me a buckling capacity of about 58.9 kips. So looking at B1, what we see is that uh, 
with a self-weight only, so a load factor of 1.0, we get a B1 of 3.84. Now that's pretty high, but not terrible. However, by the time we put in on, say, a load factor of 1.2, we're upwards of 9. <clears throat> so that's magnifying my moment by a factor of 9. We can see in the equation, we can back out of that, that if we, in fact, uh, calculate it, we can calculate about 1.35 is when this thing is just going to go to infinity, i.e., the top cord is going to buckle at that point. That is less than what I wanted for a load factor of 1.4. As Mr. Jacobs pointed out, the, the rules are not necessarily hard and fast when you get into this business. So 1.4 is not a hard and fast rule, but in this case, that's what I wanted. <clears throat> so if I knew nothing else about this truss, I would say, Mr. Erector, I think we need to put some temporary bracing on before we let this off the hook. That temporary bracing, then, we go to Appendix 6. We find the nodal bracing provisions for columns. In this case, we calculate the required strength to be about 0.6 kips. The stiffness we require <clears throat> from the same area to be about 0.9 kips per inch. Stiffness is an important part because a lot of times we use cables for these braces, and cables tend to be axially um, reasonably flexible. So we do have to pay attention to the stiffness term. We're going to apply wind loads to our truss now. For a 68 mile an hour wind, and that represents the 90 times the 0.75 that Mr. Jacobs talked about earlier, we get about 13 pounds a linear foot as the wind force on that top cord. However, the top and bottom cords are the only load paths for all of the wind on the truss, including the web elements. So by the time we collect additional wind off the web elements, we end up with about 25 pounds a linear foot on that top cord. We take that, we figure out what the reaction would be if we had a support at the middle of the truss, which is where we're going to put our brace, and we end up with an additional three kips of load from the wind. So we would add that to our bracing force in order to size up any potential cabling in this case. So in summary, what we would do based on the hand analysis is recommend some bracing. Might be some cabling. Perhaps it's a member back to another stable part of the roof. We use that quite often. Uh, the bottom cord would still have to be evaluated here, not so much from a stability standpoint, <clears throat> but more for it's a very long unbraced length subject to a lot of wind, so we need to make sure there's not a problem there. If all had gone well, and our stability issues had not been a real problem here, the question might arise where you look at the unity checks, and the unity check fails when you combine wind plus the self-weight of the truss. At that point, we have to start wondering about that wind load again, as Mr. Jacobs pointed out. Just how real is that wind load, and do we want to account for it all? And I point this out because <clears throat> at 68 miles an hour, we had a wind load of 25 pounds a linear foot. If we take that and we look at 30 miles an hour on the same truss, that gives me a load of 4 pounds a linear foot. Well, most of the time, nobody's going to be erecting steel at 30 miles an hour and above. So sometimes we can work with our erector and talk about these issues and come up with a safe game plan that maybe is not quite as conservative as accounting for the full 25. Next, we're going to take this truss <clears throat> and put it through a computer analysis. So you build your computer uh, model just like you normally would. You put in your nominal geometry. In this case, we're using a direct analysis, so we are going to reduce the stiffness by 20% right off the bat. We're going to sweep the top and bottom cords, as we talked about before. So this is clearly a three-dimensional analysis, not a 2D truss. In fact, it's that third dimension that is of interest because that's the dimension that the truss will buckle in. <clears throat> We're going to insert nodes at the splice points so that we can see what kind of splice forces we have. And then we're going to scale our member weights up or down as needed in order to account for the connections. We need to apply some reasonable boundary conditions. Here you have to go and you look at the, the drawings to figure out what is going to be in place at the time you install the truss. 
figure out what's a reasonable set of boundary conditions to apply. We're going to be doing a p-delta analysis. It's nonlinear. That's kind of a given. If it's particularly sensitive, a p-delta with large deformation type analysis may be required to help bring, bring it back in a little bit. The top and bottom cords are going to be continuous, as we talked about before. What about the web members? Let's look at that issue. Here's a blow up. I know it's a little fuzzy, but it's the best one I had, of one of these truss connections. And what you can see is that each of the web members are coming in with the flanges being bolted with gussets on each side. Six bolts in each flange in those gussets. That's not exactly what I might think of as a pin connection. Seems to me that's got a lot of rigidity, but let's study it. Let's see what the issue at hand is. If I take that computer analysis and I treat those web members as pins, then the results that I'm going to get are these dashed lines. <clears throat> the black dashed line is the linear elastic analysis. It's just a baseline. No real uh, importance there. But these are the two results then from my p-delta type analyses. And what you see is that this truss wants to buckle over somewhere around 1.25 or so. It really starts to take off. So that's the pin version. If instead I fix all of the webs, then the same type of analysis is going to be very different. Now I'm looking at these solid lines. <clears throat> and what we see is that these solid lines really start to take off uh, up here around 5.5. And what we're measuring, and I didn't point this out earlier, I apologize, what we're measuring is the out-of-plane displacement down here of the top cord. And that's what we're measuring as it takes off. That's a representation of the buckling of the truss. So clearly this assumption of webs being fixed or pinned to their cords makes a significant difference. Unfortunately, it hasn't been readily studied. So let's take a minute just to see what's maybe going on. For the pin case, if we look at that truss and we look at the results, what we see in this case is that it is the top cord that is acting solely to prevent the buckling of that truss. And it's, wor it's working very hard, obviously, out at the middle and less at the ends. Okay? But that's our pin case. When we go into a fixed case, we can see that the bottom cord, in fact, participates almost as much as the top cord. But clearly, the entire truss is working for us to try to prevent that buckling of the truss. So a big difference in the behavior here. But what about this assumption? Is it a good assumption? Well, what I like to do is I like to come in and scan all of these web members to figure out what kind of forces <clears throat> I'm getting in those members at a load factor 1.4. And in this case, I get a maximum force or moment at the end of about 2.2 kip feet. Well, if you recall, we had six bolts in each flange, clearly capable of a minor moment such as 2.2 kip feet. So I feel pretty good about this assumption, and we can move on. We would next look at the wind loads. Again, 68 mile an hour winds. We would calculate those. Uh, we look at the deflections of the truss. In this case, the out-of-plane deflection just from wind is about 9 inches. Now, that, again, it sounds like a lot, but reality is at 68 mile an hour, nobody's out there watching this truss deflect 9 inches. So really not that big a concern, particularly when you consider that's L over 160, and I know people who have designed buildings as flexible as that. You, do, you go and look at the unity checks then, and you can see that they're very low. And that's typically the case when we are far away from a stability problem. The wind loads plus the stability issues usually aren't that bad unless we're very close to a stability problem to start with. The second case study I want to <clears throat> talk about is a, a pedestrian truss. Um, it's a box truss. In this case, the erector wanted to erect the truss in the following manner. They wanted to erect this side over here, and then this side over here, and then fill in the various web members on the horizontal to tie it all together. We actually got called in after the fact on this particular job, and you'll see why shortly. 
let's take that core or that uh, trust on the far side out of the trust for a minute and look at what's going on. This is an elevation of that truss. It's about 11,000 pounds, 77 feet long, 12 feet cord to cord. It's got a 14 by 38 top cord, <clears throat> but this is a Varendale truss. So that cord is turned strong axis vertical. So it's the weak axis of the 14 by 38 that is preventing the buckling of that truss. So let's take two minutes of hand calculations to figure out where we might stand. We do the same thing we did before, WL squared over 8, M over D. We get about 8.7 kips. We look at KL over RY in this case because it's the weak axis that's preventing the buckling of the truss. It's at 590. That's probably the first red flag. That is pretty high. We need to be paying attention to that. Our axial capacity then, based on a KL over RY of 590, is only 8.07 kips. So already, when I ratio those two numbers, I'm kind of already over my nominal capacity. If I put any reasonable fee and load factors into the equation, I'm way over in terms of a uh, unity check. The real concern then falls in the fact that I have not yet considered any strong axis moments. This is a Varendale truss, so clearly I'm going to have strong axis moments in these cords. I have not considered the weak axis at all. I have weak axis out of plane bending from the stability, but also weak axis moments from the wind. So summing all that up, what do we end up with? Well, we get the following. This was a truss that used to be a nice straight truss. It now has a nice kink right here in the middle where it buckled over. They were setting the truss. They had it temporarily bolted up to the supports. They were releasing the truss, and the truss buckled over. Fortunately, they had not completely released the truss. They still had uh, their slings on the truss and were able to catch it. No one was hurt, no real property damage, no real problems. They did have to learn how to heat straighten in order to get the truss back to an erectable form and figure out another way to erect the, the uh, box truss. The important aspect of this to point out is this was an experienced director that had directed a lot of complicated things. It was not readily apparent to their naked eye that this could be a stability problem. And as such, it really goes to this, the point that Mr. Jacobs made. Structures are getting more complicated. In this case, they're getting more slender. Slender, and they really we have to pay attention to these stability issues that can be in place before all of the structure comes to its final condition. With that, we'll open it up to questions. Okay, I do have a couple questions. Actually, I got a couple questions for Will, so we'll go over those. Um, first, so Will, we had a question. What brought you to the erection side of the contract? Um, initially, we were pulled in on a job where there had been a uh, a failure of the shoring, and so we we came in and <clears throat> were asked to to redo uh, the shoring for the uh, the rebuild. So that was sort of our first taste of it, and uh, I guess did a decent enough job there to get a call back, and it sort of mushroomed from there. And um, we sort of enjoy the uh, uh, concept of having liability that uh, disappears uh, immediately at the end of the job. And um, we've also found that erectors and general contractors um, actually tend to pay you when you're done, as opposed to perhaps some architects I could name. Okay, thank you. And then also, can you use the lower load factors with the loads in ASC 37? For um, example, in ASC 7, a 1.6 factor is used for live loads. Should 1.6 be used for the construction live loads? Right. ASCE 37 actually has its own loading combinations that take precedence for construction loading over ASCE 7, if you're in that document. And they do have lower uh, load factors. For instance, they use 0.5 on live loads. And again, it's not on the design live loads, it's on the construction type live loads. So depending on the live load class for what's being built that's discussed in that document, you have a lower loading and a lower load factor that you would use. Okay. Good. And we did have a number of questions on um, wind 
loading reduction? Yes. Um, I have seen a number of questions come through about, you know, what uh, uh, alternatives uh, are there. Um, has there been any research done? You know, uh, it was pointed out that uh, MBMA has some guidance for wind load reduction for multiple frames. Um, the the 602 kip sort of uh, structured uh, base shear for that temporary um, uh, construction uh, case that I mentioned was just a pure uh, analytical run through of ASE 37. Uh, I don't think that that is really a real number, and ASE 37 does allow you to use alternate methods. So if you have an alternate method, such as perhaps this MBMA reduction, um, then you are certainly welcome to use that um, with your engineering judgment. Um, there are many other codes around the world that do have um, shielding effects built into their main wind, wind loads. Um, unfortunately, the U.S. codes do not, so you're, you're sort of left to your own devices. Okay. Um, well, we can continue with the presentation, and we'll get more questions at the end then. Too. Sounds good. So heading into this uh, really complex uh, stability issue, uh, what we are going to be talking about is on the hook stability. And what I mean by that is can you lift up a member or a combination of members so that they don't fold in on themselves or, or buckle just due to their own self-weight? So if you take a look at the picture on the screen, you might be asking yourself, I don't really understand what's so complex about that. It happens all the time. You know, the erector picks up the beam, they set it down in place, they put the bolts in it, and then they repeat. In fact, you can actually take this same picture and put it in your analysis software and duplicate the picture, right? So it must not be that hard. Well, the complexity actually comes in in two phases. Um, first of all, most analysis software is not really geared toward on-the-hook stability type calculations. You know, they, they have trouble dealing with the concepts of balance and dynamic stability, you know, hanging things in midair. So you have to come in and put fictitious boundary conditions on your model in order to prevent numerical instabilities from occurring. But when you put in those boundary conditions, you also have to be careful not to adversely affect the model so that the behavior is no longer like the real world behavior. So it's sort of a, a chicken and an egg between stopping um, analysis, uh, numerical analysis issues um, and still letting your model run like it would in the real world. Right. So that's, that's one issue. The second complexity is that most buckling type equations are built around the assumption that your member is not free to rotate at the ends, and that is not the case here. Um, so a lot of the strength equations you might used to be using are no longer valid. Right. There is um, a good deal of literature out there on uh, more simplistic cases such as these that will provide formula for you to use to, to calculate whether they're stable or not. But what happens if you run into a more complicated issue? Um, this uh, is a building in which we were asked to check the on-the-hook stability of a series of 226-foot-long barrel trusses. Now, generally, the erector in a case like this might you know, get their rigger on board, um, rig up the truss, lift it up a foot above the ground or so, go to lunch, come back, and if the truss is still uh, hanging there in the air, then they're good to go. They'll go ahead and lift it up and put it in place. And, you know, that's really not that bad of an idea. I mean, that's sort of experimental testing at its best. But in this case, the erector knew that these were very, very slender trusses and that they were concerned that they might have to bring another crane on site in order pr to uh, provide some additional pick points to lift these trusses from. So they went ahead and gave us a call and brought us in to do a little analysis beforehand uh, to tell them how they needed to pick the trusses. And when we first looked at this job, we thought, you know, those look an awful lot like joists. So this occurs all the time with joists. You lift them up, you put them in place. So we did sort of a literature survey to see if there was any information out there as far as on-the-hook stability of joists. And what we found was there's actually a lot of information on joist stability, but it, it's almost all um, treating the condition of what do you do when you set the joist down before you let it go. So different um, bridging that you have to put in or, or connections on the end. There really wasn't a whole lot out there on, on the hook stability. In fact, the only thing that we found was in SJI's uh, technical digest number nine, 
which is the handling and erection of steel joists and joist girders. And they said this, that the determination of lifting points and rigging techniques by a qualified person is critically important for long span joists. The erector must be aware of the possibility that the joist could fold up under its own weight if not lifted and handled properly. Well, our erector was very well aware that his trusses could possibly fold up under their own self-weight. You know, that's why they called us. So this sentence really doesn't help us out a lot. It says, yes, there could be a problem, but not how to solve it. So we sort of ended up coming up uh, with our own methodology. And it's very similar to the direct analysis method uh, that Clint just went over with regards to checking the stability of a truss in place with uh, the added complexity of these boundary condition issues that I was discussing. So step one is to enter in your typical geometry and to select some trial support locations. Now in this case, we selected these uh, two support cables in such a manner that that's sort of the farthest apart that the erector thought that he could get a spreader beam from one single crane. So this was sort of our, our uh, best case scenario from the erector's standpoint. Then we added some restraints, in this case restraints at the top of the cables and then a uh, lateral restraint at the top of the truss to prevent um, rigid body motion sort of left and right on the screen here. But we still don't have the um, numerical analysis handled from uh, a standpoint of what happens sort of into and out of the page with this truss. We'll deal with that in just a second. Because the first thing you need to do for a direct analysis is to come up with an initial uh, shape, an initial deformation to be able to run this direct analysis on. And Clint was using a, a sort of an L over 1000 sine wave sweep on, on his truss, but for something this complicated sort of hanging in the air, that really didn't seem applicable. We wanted to have sort of a, a more realistic initial buckling shape. So we decided to run an elastic eigenvalue buckling analysis to determine our initial shape to use in the direct analysis. Well, in order to do this, we needed to come up with a way to make the model run without affecting the buckling shape. And the way we did that was by adding a very weak spring at each and every node of the truss. So therefore, the spring stiffness affected all nodes equally it allowed the model to run without affecting the shape by having uh, additional stiffness at one node that you might not have at another node. Right? So we ran this, and this is a condition of making sure you take a look at all of your computer output. Because in this case, the first buckling mode that was given to us by the computer was if you inverted gravity and you pushed up on your truss, the cables buckled. All right? Thank you, SAP. Very helpful. So we kept looking until we found a buckling mode that made some realistic sense, which would be this one. So in this case, the bottom cord was buckling outwards, and the um, cantilevered portions were sort of uh, rolling over. So what we did was we took the deflections of each of these nodes, and we exported them. And we did not scale these deflections. We just took the actual deflections. And it really doesn't matter if you're just trying to see if the truss is stable or not, you know, if you're not trying to come up with some bracing. It doesn't matter what magnitude you use for the initial shape up to a point. So uh, I'll show a graph in a minute that, that proves that. But in this case, we didn't scale them. We just took them straight out of the model. And then we re-imported them and matched the geometry of the truss to this buckled shape. Right? So we essentially created a brand new model in the form of the elastic buckling shape. Then we just went through the same steps that Clint just described. So we reduced the stiffness per the direct analysis method. Um, in this case, in order to further avoid adversely affecting the behavior of the truss, we actually removed even more springs and just left a few very weak springs at the inflection points to provide this numerical stability. And then we ran our second order analysis. We tried the deflections on this truss at this bottom middle node in order to see uh, when the truss actually started to buckle. And so we're going to look at this node here in a second. So this is a graph. Um, on the vertical axis is the ratio of the applied load to the total self-weight. So 1.0 would be when the full self-weight is on the truss. The horizontal axis is the deflection, 
uh, the center of that bottom chord of that node that we just looked at. So you'll see up mm, around point 0.8 or so, this truss really starts to go. So it never did reach its self-weight under this condition. If you take a look at what this uh, looks like visually, uh, the bottom graph corresponds to the top picture. So that red dot, we are loading the truss up. And this is at about 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.9 of its self-weight. Right? That is not what you want the truss to look like when you pick it up. So this was obviously not a good condition. We needed to choose some more support points. Now just briefly back to the point I made earlier on uh, whether you have to scale the magnitude of the initial shape or not. Uh, this is showing that same graph with um, an unscaled uh, magnitude and those deflections multiplied by 3 or divided by 3. Uh, you see they all sort of still end up buckling over here at the same point. So it doesn't matter up to a point. All right, so what do we do? Well, we repeat this process. You know, we choose a new support condition. You determine another buckling mode. You, know, you run your second order analysis, and you keep iterating until you find a support condition that provides you with enough safety factor you know, to make you feel comfortable with picking the truss in this manner. And then once you do that, you take your forces and you check the strength of the members. So what's shown on the screen now is the final uh, configuration of the truss support. In this case, we ended up using two cranes and four pick points. So just to show how that affects that same graph we were looking at, here's our original configuration down here, which again didn't reach the self-weight of the truss. And then the solid line represents the updated support scheme, where you know, we're getting up to a safety factor of about 1.4 um, to buckling. So you know, again, we don't have a whole lot of fat in this, but this was a very weak truss, and this was about the best that you were going to do. So if you want to take a look at that um, graphically, and here's the same uh, sort of type of, of graphic, where we're loading with the bottom red dot. Now we're up to about the self-weight here. 1.2, 1.4, 1.6, and 1.8 times the self-weight. It's gone. So in the end, this is what we provided the erector. You know, we had a document which showed the uh, choker cables, the different lengths of cables, exactly where they were going to be attached to the truss. So we took that out into the field, and here's your final product. And everything went well. You know, we've got two cranes, four pick points. It looks nice. And this is really where I should probably end the story. Uh, you know, we did this fancy analysis, and it looks great on the screen. We got our nice photo. But probably the most interesting thing about this project happened with something that we didn't analyze. And you might have noticed that all these graphics that I've been showing, all these pictures, show the truss in its vertical position. Is that how the truss appeared on the job site? Well, the answer, of course, is no. It showed up on its side on flatbed trucks, and they put it together in the field. So the truss started its life like this, you know, laying flat on the ground down here. So the erector, doing what erectors do, came up with a method to lift the truss into place. And their method was to introduce a second set of cables. You can see one of them coming down right here to the bottom cord of the truss. So they were going to pick the truss up horizontally, and once it got high enough in the air, roll the bottom into position vertically with this second set of cables. Now, I've mentioned several times that these trusses are extremely weak out of plane. So what do you think happens when you try to pick up in the middle portion of the truss while it's laying on its side? Well, that's what happens. Um, this gentleman right here is about six feet tall. So this truss is now six feet in the air in the center, and the end of the truss is still sitting happily on Mother Earth. So when this happens, and you're the erector, do you set it back down, or perhaps call the erection engineer? No, of course not. You just pull harder. So the erector pulled harder. So that's what happened. Right? You pull harder, it goes higher. We're now, I don't know, 12 feet in the air. Again, the ends of the truss still sitting on the ground. And I've learned you can learn a lot by sort of observing the behavior of the iron workers in the field. And if you notice in this picture, there's actually a good number of iron workers now milling around 
this trust lift. And that means that something unusual is happening, and it's interesting, but it's not yet really unsafe. Right? So everybody's interested in it. So again, do you set it down? Do you call the engineer? No. You just pull harder. Notice how many iron workers are now in the picture. All right. When you get to this point, probably a good idea to leave the premises. But they kept yanking on it, and eventually they did lift it up into position, and they set it down on its supports, and notice that it has a nice seven-foot kink in the bottom cord, which looks disconcertingly like the buckled shape in our graphical analysis. Um, this was actually a very good erector, and they were able to come in and fix the situation. They, they came in, and they started on one end, and they put in tie beams between the truss and this braced wall over here, all right, and pulled it into position and straightened it out with cable dogs, and it was inspected. They replaced some bolts on it, and everything turned out to be okay. And then for the next truss, they actually came up with a different method where they um, sort of pre-compressed the arch. They pre-compressed the ends of the truss against dead men on the ground, and then they took that arch and rotated it up into position. So that worked a lot better, and the rest of the job went very smoothly. So this just sort of goes to show that there's some things you really might not think of before the job that, that can have a big effect on the erection sequencing. All right, so we've been through the rules, the technical guidance, loading, stability issues. Now let's talk about communication, conveying the plan. So the big thing is to discuss with the erector before starting work what the final deliverable will be, um, whether it's going to be hand sketches, um, 2D details, or this full 3D you know, color-coded staged BIM model. Uh, we generally tend to provide these engineer direction sequencing information in addition to the standard fabricator's e-sheets, sort of work with those e-sheets. And if you happen to be in a part of the country where um, the fabricator does the connection design, it's very useful to work with the fabricator to provide them with any loading conditions that you determine from your uh, construction analysis that might be different than the engineer of records uh, loading conditions. So you can get that built in to the connection design up front. So as sort of an example of these three different um, types of erection plans, your first one, the uh, hand sketch. Um, in this case, this was just a column that we were erecting at the end of some cantilevered beams. Hand sketch and a couple of steps. You know, not a big deal. What we probably do the most of is what I would call a one-sheeter, which is a uh, sort of a primarily 2D detail sheet with a bunch of steps and details. Um, as an example of this, uh, here is the sheet that we provided for that 300,000-pound truss that I showed a picture of back at the beginning of the webinar. So we had you know, a, a rigging plan, a sequence of steps, and then some bracing diagrams, cable bracing, things like that. And these are really good in that they are uh, providing a reasonable amount of detail. Um, they're adequate for a majority of jobs, and they also allow for them some flexibility. You know, um, out in the field, things happen, like we just saw, that um, uh, change conditions rather quickly. So it's nice if um, you provide enough detail to do the job safely, but still allow the erector to um, come up with some of the solutions on his own. And so the final step is um, the most comprehensive, comprehensive, and that involves using sort of a 3D BIM type presentation where each and every step is shown. Uh, this is one sheet of approximately, I think, 70 sheets on this job. And this was a job where we were uh, erecting some transfer trusses over the top of an existing hospital. So on each sheet, we showed the new members being erected in red. Each and every member was labeled, number of bolts to put in, welding, et cetera. Um, so this is obviously an awful lot of work, but it does provide uh, explicit direction for all parties involved and allows everyone to visualize what's going on, and track what's going on. Uh, the disadvantage is there is very little flexibility in the field. Um, so if things go wrong, you have to be ready and willing to update your erection plan and, and get things moving again because you'll end up holding the job up. Um, one bonus um, for a plan like this that is extremely owner-friendly. Owners like to see pictures of their buildings going up ahead of time. And with um, plans like this, 
you know, you can create well, animations such as this, which um, you know is basically just our plans one after the other um, that shows the sequencing of how we're going to uh, erect uh, this one series of trusses over the top of this hospital. So sort of some final thoughts um, on erection plans. Um, you definitely want to talk through the possible erection sequences with the erector. You know, they, they're smart guys. They've done this for a long time. And if you can sort of use their ideas and, and just modify them or add to them based on your analysis, um, it will work out better in the end. Uh, it's a good idea to have a superintendent and field personnel uh, that will be on the job involved as early as possible. Um, they all like to do things a little differently, so if they sort of have a little bit in the game, um, they'll go along with it, and uh, you'll end up with a better product. And finally, be realistic. Um, this is not a uh, facet of structural engineering where you can uh, set it and forget it, uh, so to say. Um, things change in the field, and so you have to be uh, willing to get in there and, and change things as necessary. And probably the most important point, and not one on this slide, is to work with people that want you on the job. Um, it's nice when the uh, erector and fabricator want you as part of the team. And uh, we've been fortunate enough to work with some, some very good fabricators and erectors who do view us as part of the team. And uh, it makes things go a lot more smoothly. So uh, with that, I will uh, conclude. Uh, this portion, and we will be happy to uh, answer any questions in the uh, remaining time we have. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll, um, I do have a couple questions. We have well, we have, I have more than a couple, but we have time for a couple. So first of all, if we can go back to slide 46 for Clint here. Let me just move this back. And the question is, let me see something. I'm having trouble moving back. The question is on the truss, the unbraced length of the top cord and the what is the unbraced length of the top cord during the lift? Also, what is the unbraced length of the bottom cord in the cantilevered section? So is, is this the slide? You said 46? Well, there is no slide on 46. I think, no I think this might be the original 46. Yeah. Yeah, here, this is labeled 46. It's actually slide 47 in there. Right. So. I think the que I think the question is geared around much of what uh, Mr. Jacobs just talked about. When you know, when you start to look at a piece of steel that doesn't have a lot of boundary conditions uh, moving through the air, it's somewhat hard to try to define um, unbraced lengths. Uh, if you will, in order to try to look at buckling conditions. Presumably, uh, the person asking this question is maybe trying to look at a buckling condition by hand. Um, the best thing that you can do, again, this really goes to what Mr. Jacobs was doing. Generally, if the truss is flexible enough that there's concerns with picking it, then we are going to need to try to figure out how we think the truss will buckle when it's picked. And once we understand how it might buckle, then you can start to get an, a sense of what kind of unbraced lengths might be reasonable to do a quick hand check on. But usually at that point, you've done some, some kind of a computer analysis anyhow. So you might be better off just plugging along there. But you have to get an idea of how the truss might buckle. And that's obviously a function of how you pick it, how long it is, the geometry, several things going on there. Okay, thank you. Um, what is a cable dog? <laughs> a cable dog is essentially a, a winch that grabs two portions of cable and, and tightens them up. So uh, just think of it as a winch. Okay, thank you. And are there any typical rules of thumb 
in construction design, erection design? Hmm. Um, I can think of a couple. For instance, Clint talked about the um, sort of a connection factor on trusses where probably a, a good thing to go in with would be the truss weighs about 25% more than your analytical weight uh, just as a starting point um, for analysis. Um, if something looks like it's too slender to pick up, it probably is. <laughs> Clint, you got any? No. There's so many aspects of the erection engineering uh, that I'm not exactly sure what the question was trying to find in terms of a rule of thumb. Um, so I don't have any off the top of my head. Okay. That is good. Well, it is. Our time is up now. We do have other questions that we will get to, um, but we, we don't have the time right now. So I want to thank you, Will, and thank you, Clint.